understand clearly on the long term basis you have a very negative outlook but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be long the market today what are you doing investing wise not a lot i don't want to i don't want to hedge but i probably have the smallest positions i've had in i had some big positions earlier in the year i'm sort of sitting and waiting there's a lot of uncertainty over who the next fed chairman will be what their attitude toward the diminution of QE will be. You've got the whole Syria thing. Um, I like to be very patient and then when I see something go a little bit crazy and I just don't see anything right now. A lot of people have told me and Stephanie that it doesn't matter who the next Fed chairman is, whether it's Janet Yellen or Larry Summers, the policies aren't going to be that much different. Um, I take it you disagree. Oh, it totally matters. I mean, when you think back, of what Paul Volcker, Alan Greenspan, and Ben Bernanke have meant to markets, it's pretty naive to say the next Fed chairman won't matter. They may not know why it matters, and I may not know why it matters, but it is, it is a really, really important appointment. But do you have any idea how either of those two candidates would run the Fed and what kind of an impact he, in the case of Summers, or she would have on financial markets as chairman? I don't. Um, there's market consensus and I have my views, but I probably wouldn't want to share them on national television. On which you don't, you don't strike it. me as Mr. Consensus, though. Um, you know, I, again, I'm not going to bite on this one, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's say, so your positions are smaller, you've cut positions, but what are you doing? Are you not completely sitting in cash? Okay, so my guess is and I, I believe the market is topping, but you know the economists have picked it, I mean the stock market predicted seven out of the last three recessions, I predicted seven out of the last three bear markets. I started in a bear market in 76, so I'm kind of poisoned, I have a bearish bias. But I, where I am on the market right now is, is if you gave me a stock I really like, um, I'll buy it, and if you gave me a stock I really hate, I'll short it. But in terms of having some big position, long or short indexes, or, or some exposure to the stock market. Right now, I'm lost, and uh, I don't play when I'm lost. And I know in the future I won't be lost, and I'll play big then. But well, I don't. You can sit in cash because you're managing your own money. Clearly, you I ran a hedge fund. I could sit in cash fund. when I was managing other people's money, Stephanie. Well, for other managers out there, can they say I'm going to take two and twenty and not invest? I don't know. The way I always approach the business is, is you give me a pile of money and I'm going to try and pound that money for you over time as best I can. This whole quarterly performance and risk adjusted stuff that's invaded the hedge fund industry, I don't get it and frankly for other than 10 or 15 managers, I can't imagine why anybody would pay 2 plus 20 to what's out there. You know, when I started in the business, there was me, George Soros, Julian Robertson, Paul Tudor Jones, or Bruce Kovner. We were a couple of jokers. We were expected to make 20% a year in down markets. There was none of this, oh, I've got a risk adjusted return of eight and this. That's how two plus 20 came about. So why are hedge fund managers so much less successful now than they were then? Well, there's just too many of them. There were eight to 10 back then, somehow, 9,000 people are pricing their product off of 8 to 10 people's historic performance. And I noticed in the late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of the smart early investors and hedge funds, clients, were leaving, but they were more than replaced by state pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and so far they've been perfectly happy to get returns that our early investors would have never tolerated. Do you invest in other funds? Yes, I do. How do you make a decision of who you want to invest with? Um, I meet with them and luckily I've been in the business 35 years so I think I have a pretty good edge about what makes them just go over their investment philosophy and see whether they can make money over time. As a hedge fund manager or a former hedge fund manager, what do you think about the media circus around credits like Herbalife and all these big personalities and names involved? This isn't the way Stan Druckenmiller invests. Well, to each his own. I'm, I'm surprised because I always thought that publicizing your positions was not a good thing. It might be great for a day or two, but 
these people forget you got to get out of these positions. But when you watch all this, you don't suddenly say, you know what, maybe I want to go long Herbalife here. Maybe I want to go long Apple. The only time I really got interested in Herbalife is when you guys did the show on Bill Stewart's. That got my attention because that's not some guy that's trying to do a day trade or somebody's short or this or that. That's a serious, serious investor and that would get my attention. What else is getting your attention these days? Well, I'm very focused on the new Fed chairman, mm -hmm. which, and I'm perfectly willing to wait a few weeks to find out. So, so, so that leads me to a question. If you've got the small, you, you were saying earlier, the smallest positions that you can remember, right? You may have ever had? In most things, yes. Okay, so, and you also have a great track record calling bear markets. Yes. So, if... By the way, it's not that great because I've called bear markets that didn't happen. <laughs> How does it feel to you right now? How close are we to a bear market? As long as the Fed is printing money, um, not very close. That's why the issue of tapering and where we go with it is so important. I don't really care whether we go to 70 or 65 in September, but if you tell me QE is going to be removed over 9 or 12 months, that's a big deal because it's my belief that QE has subsidized all asset prices and when you remove that subsidization the market will go down. So asset levels for asset prices, right, that would suggest that a lot of what we see in asset prices is illusory, that if you take the Fed away, there's the, the fundamental underpinnings just aren't there. My first mentor and boss, Doc Drellis in Pittsburgh, used to tell me it takes hundreds of million dollars to manipulate a stock up. But the minute you have this phony buying stop, it can go down on no volume and it can just reprice immediately. I personally think as long as this game is on, assets will stay elevated. But when you remove that prop, and let's face it, the Fed has said they're targeting asset prices, those prices can adjust immediately. June was very instructive because if you didn't believe before that the exit was going to be tough, the mere hint that maybe in three months, if the economy is good, we might go from 85 billion a month to buying 65 billion a month, cause that kind of havoc and risk around the world. How in the world does anybody think when the actual exit actually happens, prices are not going to respond? It's silly. Stan, you said you have the smallest positions in most things. Most things has me thinking, well, what do you then have big positions in? I don't have what I would call it takes courage to be a pig positions in anything. I am long some Japanese equities. Um, I am short some yen. But in terms of big outsized bets like I had earlier in the year in something like Australian dollar or frankly my b bets in Japan were bigger earlier in the year, um, everything's sort of down and waiting for the next big shot.